going to start with question number one. Uh, what does a connected healthcare system look like? Can you describe the elements that will need to work together? This is a huge question. It's a way just to kind of start things off. So, uh, so Lonnie, do you want to start with that? Sure. All right. I think the, uh, the, the, the first issue um, that I would focus on is that it needs to be patient-centric. Um, and I think we've lost sight of the, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the imperative that we, in fact, create a, a patient-centric system. So that would be one. Um, and then, you know, notwithstanding the technological difficulties, if we just simply uh, use that, uh, that model and follow the patient wherever they are, uh, again, notwithstanding the issues of privacy and security, uh, we can accumulate data at the home. Uh, which I think is going to be more important uh, as time goes on as an environment for not only generating data but for pushing back uh, information to the patient uh, as they go to the community clinic or the patient-centered uh, medical home, if you will, uh, to the hospital, to the uh, longitudinal follow-up that's going to be uh, required post-discharge. So I, I, I imagine a, a sort of an umbrella uh, that in fact surrounds uh, or, or supports the patient uh, not only uh, aggregating, uh, assimilating, and analyzing data, uh, but also using the types of connectivity, the exchange, if you will, to in fact push information back that will uh, further improve the, uh, the care of the patient. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to come here. It's, uh, it's fantastic always to come to the, to the States. I have lots of conversations talking about the kind of cultural differences and the clinical differences between the UK and the US. And one of the things that really strikes me is, is the commonality and the fact that we're all trying to do the same, the same, address the same kind of challenges and we've all got the same kind of strategic aspirations around where we're going to think. And this, and this connected, the concept of connected health is, is absolutely fundamental um, to that. And I guess I'd break it down into two, two, two aspects. So, so the first being around the kind of inputs um, to care. So, so, so for me, connective health, uh, and this is as true of our information architecture it is as our, as our service uh, design architecture, is around having a system that absolutely reflects the, the real world of our patients and the real world that our um, uh, patients journey through a care system. So setting aside the interests of organizations, setting aside the, organization, uh, the interests of the artificial distinctions that we make between payers, commissioners, in my language, uh, providers, and absolutely looking at the real world experience of, of, of our patients. So, so I, I'm still a practicing family physician when I'm looking after a patient with diabetes. I envisage a connected health world where the components of that care when I'm delivering care have a legitimate place at, at that interaction between the clinician and, and the patient. And the legitimate components are not only the kind of record that I've got, but indeed the record of other multi-professional groups that are contributing to that care. And probably most importantly, the contribution of that individual uh, uh, patient and their own aspirations and their own uh, hopes and anxieties that relate to, to that care. But if we constrain our ambition to just that, the inputs of care, I think we really fundamentally miss a trick. Because it's, it's critical, I think, that we focus not only on the inputs of care, but also on the outputs. And those things need to be equally connected. So understanding um, uh, the consequences uh, of our care, both on an individual uh, level and on a population level. So we understand uh, uh, the uh, value, uh, the, the, the antecedents and the consequences of our interventions um, across a population basis and indeed across a, an indiv individual basis. And with the very exciting uh, work that we've just been hearing around about genomics, that will be, that will be increasingly important. Um, uh, and with that, we need to hold the microphone for too long. I'm just going to give you one kind of uh, personal view around, around connection, which for me as a clinician I think is, 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 is equally important, uh, and that is connecting, connecting us all to knowledge. You know, what, what, what good looks like is getting increasingly difficult to remember uh, as a practicing clinician, and we need to stop for sort of pretending that we can remember all this every time, every consequence. We aren't going to be able to address the unexplained variation in care that you see on this side of the pond and on my side of the pond without contextually relevant uh, information support, uh, I would argue contextually relevant decision support that lets both the clinician, the clinical team and the patient know what good looks like in that particular clinical setting. Uh, and that represents a vision of, of true connection. Thank you. Well, and I'll echo a few of these ideas in my own way. So recently, having dealt with the death of my father, I would say a connected healthcare system has to be the right care in the right setting. 
It's neither too much nor too little care, and it should be thought of as a continuum, everything from ICU to hospice, because in my father's case, I was actually carrying around his living will with me and making decisions, time to go from the ICU to hospice, do not intubate, do not resuscitate, no pressors, and it was only because I'm a physician and an informatics person that I was able to do that navigation. Our connected healthcare system should make that easier for all our patients and families. You want the patient and the families at the center of this. You want their care preferences and plans well known. So you probably know I was the second human sequenced. So I actually have my own care preferences because I actually know what diseases I'm going to develop in the future. And I know, hey, if my PSA goes from 0.4 to 4, well, PSA may not be that relevant a test. But because of my genetic risks, for me, it's probably relevant. So I should be able to apply those risks and preferences to my care. And then having a learning healthcare system. It's a bit like what you said, that if there is evidence about right treatments that is discovered in the UK, why should it lag five years before it comes to the US? We should be able to not make decisions based on apprenticeship, but in fact on the learning lessons across the world. I think from a genetics perspective, it's interesting to think about this in terms of the different constituencies involved in the continuum of care. So, so looking at it from, from a genetics point of view, you have, you have the laboratory that's going to run the physical genetic sequence. And then normally associated with the laboratory, you have a laboratory geneticist or a molecular pathologist who is really expert in understanding what the implications of the genetic variants that were found are, but is removed from the patient moving a little bit closer to the patient, but a little bit further from, from that core genetics knowledge is the specialist who understands the clinical implications of that, that patient's specific indication and, and has knowledge of how you apply the output from the laboratory geneticists and laboratory pathologists to, um, to improve that patient's care. And then you have the, the, the less specialized physicians or the, the primary care physicians who have the broadest patient context but are, are more removed from the genetics of the specific conditions. And I think that part of the challenge here is making sure, not only from a care coordination standpoint, that these different um, expertises, people with these different expertises are well connected with each other and for each patient have the information that they need, but also from a knowledge development standpoint that they are collectively contributing you know, their points of view to how you refine our understanding of the connection between the range of phenotypes and genotypes that are, that are present so that that can be reused by the healthcare system in general. And what are the remaining policy and technology barriers to information sharing? Policy and technology, I mean, there's a million answers here, but you, you, you tackled something very specific this morning. If you want to continue on that or sure. if you want to go a different direction. Well, so, so let me actually just start off with a question to the audience. So anybody from New Hampshire? Oh, there is some. Yeah, okay, so yeah. a couple of people from New Hampshire. So for example, we believe it's a public good in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to share childhood immunization records with the Department of Public Health and make them available to, say, school nurses to ensure the public health safety of our commonwealth. In New Hampshire, it's illegal. Why? It's government in your face. Live free or die. Um, so, I mean, I love New Hampshire. I go to North Conway, and it's a gorgeous state. But in fact, there is generally an allergy to government intervention, including the gathering of data into centralized databases for almost any purpose, whether that's public health or research or whatever. And so we have 56 different policies in the United States called states and territories. It may very well be that a state is opt-in. No, the next state is opt-out. No, the next state is illegal. And so how are we going to do this patient-centered, coordinated learning healthcare system if we actually can't send data across state boundaries. The standards aren't so much the challenge. Sure, we'll always be tweaking the standards, but we've got transport content and vocabulary standards that are good enough. We need to work a little bit more on the policies around sharing for particular purposes and unifying meaningful consent in a, f in a way that allows all of the good purposes that we've talked about. I'd like to spend a, a moment, get off technology and talk about consent. And one of the things I struggle with is, is the notion of the patient, and I'll just say this uh, bluntly, having the prerogative to 
limit uh, the access to components of, of, of their record. Uh, so if we make a distinction between sort of uh, so-called organic health and, uh, and, and behavioral health, and we're treating a patient with uh, a uh, cardiac arrhythmia, um, and that arrhythmia turns out as being exacerbated by uh, uh, an atypical antipsychotic that prolongs the QT interval. Um, if I'm the treating physician and, doesn't, and, and don't know uh, that the patient is on this atypical antipsychotic for their bipolar disease, uh, does that patient end up getting a defibrillator? Uh, does that patient end up getting a genetic sequence to ascertain whether they've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Um, so how, how do we reconcile that? And, uh, you know, as I've brought this up, I, I, I haven't come across uh, a satisfactory um, answer. I guess my real, my real concern is that it's not being discussed enough, mm -hmm. and uh, so I just brought it up. <laughs> So I, I guess I'd start by answering this question by saying there are no technical barriers. So, so, so you know, there's a great deal of discussion around um, how technical, uh, technical ability can, can, can enable the transfer and appropriate uh, planning of, of, of care. Um, and there's some discussion around the edges, around kind of the best way to do it and the different approaches. Uh, but do you know what? That's not the key theme. That's not the key problem that we've got. We've got some fantastic technology out there. We've got some technology that's emerging on a daily basis. And what holds us back is, as always, it's culture. And, and the culture, in, certainly in the UK, is culture in two areas. It's around uh, professional culture, uh, and it's around uh, the culture with the, the public. Uh, I'm a great behaviorist. I think people do things because of what happens when they do them uh, and how they're rewarded and the consequence for their behaviors. And we've driven the culture, certainly um, uh, in the UK, around clinical professionals uh, that drives us towards creating silos, drives us towards creating locked in um, uh, uh, segments of information for particular purposes uh, where all of the all of the rewards are around holding that data in one place and not sharing it and not taking a patient centered view uh, of its utilization. Um, uh, and that is, a, that is a, a major problem, and certainly in the UK there's a great deal of emphasis at the moment around trying to address that, that professional, professional culture. The dialogue with the patients and with the public is, is, is absolutely key, and, un, and unfortunately in the UK a lot of this is, and I suspect it's the same in the US, uh, is driven by the media and is driven by um, scaremongering about the press, around, uh, around uh, people's data getting sold to the life science industry or, uh, or to insurers or, or whatever. Um, and we need, to we, need to be, we need to take the initiative, I think, in terms of uh, those who are responsible for policy makers and give a really artic clear, articulated narrative around the failure to share data across care settings kills people. This isn't about this isn't about kind of doing things slightly better. This isn't about adding the kind of icing on the cake. This is around fundamentally uh, us not being able to do the things that we need to do uh, for our patients. Uh, that moral case and that ethical case, uh, I don't think we've articulated uh, well enough. So, so I, I think this is all around culture. Yesterday, I wound up having a conversation with a California state senator about about data sharing and. It was, it, it was interesting to hear his perspective, where he was asking, why don't people share data, and, um, and what can be done about it? And we talk, wound up talking about the, the liability you know, environment and how that can constrain data sharing in certain contexts. And the, the thing that was interesting about it is, it is actually relatively clear. There's, there's a lot of areas where I don't think that there's necessarily a counter argument to this kind of sharing. There's some places where there are, but a lot of places where there isn't. And it's just a matter of more detailed regulatory frameworks being put in, in place. And I think that there's a growing you know, <coughs> awareness of the need for that, as, as, as described. And, and, and I think there's reasons to be optimistic that that, that environment will improve. And then I think, you know, from my perspective on the technology side, you know, as genetics moves very quickly, there is, there, there's just a lot of infrastructure that needs to be put in place to enable genetics to be shared in a really robust way. And I think that what's most needed is more and more examples of it fundamentally improving care and, and standards to be created based on, on those examples which enable it to be widely distrib distributed. Well said. And also you could see in, in some of these answers, culture, policy, that um, within this country since the founding of the nation, there's always been this kind of swinging back and forth between states' rights, federal rights, uh, skepticism of government, but there's really uh, something to be said about us 
as a nation going across state line for competition for open access, absolutely. So, and that's relevant now, whether you're looking at the founding of the country or today until today's political environment, absolutely. So let's go, we're gonna skip a few questions. We'll try to come back to them because I wanna try to go to question number five. How will patients and families be engaged in accessing, viewing, downloading, and transmitting healthcare data? And I actually wanna to go to you first, Lonnie, on this because it ties into your presentation. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the first issue uh, that we need to uh, acknowledge is that patients uh, and their families need to participate in this process. And uh, again, I, don't, I haven't uh, surveyed this room, but um, I'm actually surprised uh, as I travel about the country to discover that there is a reluctance, a hesitation uh, among providers uh, to share that sort of information with patients. I don't know if it's a liability issue, uh, or an expectation that they'll have to spend more time explaining uh, arcane aspects of, of, of clinical physiology, um, but I think there is there 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 is a reluctance uh, to share. So the first issue is that it needs to be shared. Um, what we've done, and uh, I, I touched on it during my presentation, uh, is is actually either developed or acquired technologies uh, that, in fact, give patients insight uh, into the information that we have on them. Uh, into the uh, the uh, the uh, observations that we've made as we relate that information to evidence-based standards, and then connecting um, the requirements for the particular uh, patient to the healthcare delivery system. So there are issues around efficiency. Do you really know to go, need to go to an emergency room as opposed to a uh, a clinic, as opposed to uh, clinical interventions, whether they be diagnostic. Uh, or therapeutic in nature, but but certainly uh, creating this link, uh, pre creating a bi-directional flow of uh, of insight between the patient and the various uh, members of a care team, we think is essential to the broader uh, issues around quality and cost that we're all grappling with. Also, I remember uh, I tried your I mean I triage I triage yeah you bought that a few years ago and I remember seeing Mark Petalina give a demonstration, and it was, uh, yeah, we're, we're it's seeing, incredible. You know, many millions of downloads um, uh, a, a month. People are asking good questions, and the ability to, uh, again, to uh, analyze those questions uh, and then uh, direct patients to the appropriate provider right. is, is important. And as, as, as if you can all download iTriage, if you're curious, you can see that there's no real context uh, as, as it, in fact, you, you know, suggest symptoms. Uh, that might indicate that you've got otitis media or sore throat or something like that, but you can clearly get a sense of where we're going as we combine, you know, sort of a trigger, a particular symptom, and contextualize it relative to the to, to this broader uh, base of data that, that that are articulated, and then the analytics to actually uh, perhaps identify a diagnostic or a diagnosis or a therapeutic approach that had been missed and then to sort of consummate the transaction by saying, you know, this is the place that you need to go. Maybe it's an ACO, maybe it's a specialty clinic, um, maybe it's back to your living room to, uh, you know, do some push-ups or something. But that's the, that, that's the idea. Mark, over to you. Want me to repeat the question or you got it? Uh, no, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm sort of wondering if there are any patients in the room, actually. You just put your hand oh, up if you're a patient. <laughs> Most of us, hopefully, yeah. we're we probably kind of, about 40 now. We sort of have this, we have this kind of conversation, do we not? Um, uh, and, and it feels like there are kind of different species. You know, there's a whole bunch of other people out there who are patients. And, uh, you know, uh, John, John gave a kind of very good account of his own personal experiences around uh, about being a carrier. But that, that, applies to, that applies to all of us. My father suffers from dementia, and I'm kind of intimately involved in, in trying to co coordinate his care. So I, I kind of str I, I struggle with this, this question because it's, it's it's, it's us, and you could get rid of the word patient and talk about, and talk, talk about all of us. Um, certainly in the, in the UK, there is a, uh, a, a very pr a profound shift at the moment around uh, uh, moving power towards um, public and, and, and patients, uh, and then realizing that, frankly, we are unlikely to meet the uh, sustainability challenge, the productivity challenge that all every healthcare system in the world has to uh, address at the moment if we continue to view patients as being uh, passive, uh, consumers of care, passive consumers of resource, rather than um, active resources in their own right, and people who are, uh, frankly, experts uh, in their own condition, uh, experts in their own lifestyle and their own 
compliance. Um, and uh, it's only when we start to approach um, uh, and we have an adult adult relationship with the people who are we are responsible for caring uh, and we start a, uh, uh, seeing it as an equal partnership uh, that we are likely to create uh, systems that are um, economically and from a quality perspective uh, much more effective. Um, over in the UK, there's some of the in, uh, initiatives that, that we have going at the moment is around, around giving patients access to, to their record, which we've committed to do uh, in the next 18 months, certainly their GP record, which is a cradle to grave uh, record online but we're wanting to that's just the first step on the, on on the ladder we wanted to, to move much further than that and giving them much more control of the record so that they can download it and they can um, uh, uh, do things with it and we, we've tried to create a kind of a vibrant market of information intermediaries and and app developers who can take records and do things with something that in the U, in the US you're far way ahead of us um, we are looking to to systematically uh, measure quality and outcomes across the the system and give patients access to meaningful and comparative data so they kind of understand uh, absolutely kind of the services that are that they're going to and we're trying to connect patients uh, in a very meaningful way with uh, people like them what, what they want to do is kind of understand the experiences of people who have been through similar kind of healthcare experiences or indeed been uh, treated in similar settings and understand their perspective and 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 there but perhaps the kind of most profound thing and I'll stop on this point is 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 is, is capturing patient experience and capture, capturing patient reported outcome measures as an intrinsic part of our quality improvement programs um, and I think that's kind of perhaps one of the most powerful things that we can do to kind of drive accountability, uh, quality and, and transparency. Uh, and I suspect in terms of uh, the resources that, that, that they operate out there um, in the healthcare system, I suspect, suspect the patients and the public are actually one of the most underutilized resources uh, that we have today. So remember that Meaningful Use Stage 2 certification actually requires that EHRs allow this or enable this download, view, access, transmit. Only problem is not a lot of places to transmit the data to. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many folks have ever used Health Vault, but it's probably one of the worst designed web applications on the internet. I mean, it takes a team of PhDs just to log in, right? So we need apps that offer value to our patients and families. And so some examples. Uh, a guy named Adam Bosworth, who was the original manager at Google Health, went off and founded a company called Kiaz. He said, you know what will bring value? I'm going to put your labs online in context with educational materials. So people went, they looked at their labs, they said, oh, my CBC, my hematocrit is 42, normal, okay, fine. And they never went back. There was no value in going to the site. Then he said, hmm, that didn't work. Care plans. You're a diabetic. I'll produce a care plan about your diabetes. So they went, they read their care plan, and they never went back. So then his idea was, how about this? Social networking for health. You'll get your family members together in a network. You'll tweet each other's weight every day. I mean, a little weird. Uh, you'll share exercise plans, and you'll build a social networking competition for wellness. Suddenly, it was sticky. Right. Suddenly, people went back. Suddenly, it provided a reason to access your data online in the context of staying well in a competitive dopamine-fueled fashion. Right. <laughs> so I would encourage any entrepreneurs in the room, now that Meaningful Use Stage 2 requires this functionality, go build apps that provide value. Well or provide dopamine. You're right. <laughs> Sandy, go for so it. So to focus on the family-based piece, piece of this, from a genetics perspective, if you look at things clinically for inherited disease, what you'd really ideally like to do is provide patients with family-based care. It helps in a number of different ways. Very often in genetics, you, you do a gene, you sequence a gene, you find variants of unknown significance in that gene, and you're trying to figure out what they imply. One of the best ways to figure out what they imply is to see whether they segregate with disease or not in a family, and, and to track that over time. So you have you have clinical value associated with linking the data of different family members together. You also have financial value there, because very often you'll sequence a patient to understand, this is something Colin McRae, one of our cardiologists, talks about. You'll sequence a patient to understand what the cause of their cardiomyopathy is. And so today we'll sequence 51 genes to do that, tens of thousands of base pairs of DNA. And often you'll be able to come up with one base pair of DNA that is the cause of cardiomyopathy in that person. 
Now you can take that one base pair and just look at that in all of their family members, very cheap test, to determine who has that variant and who doesn't have that variant and, and appropriately prescribe, prescribe care based on that. So there's a real cost optimization there. But on the flip side, you have the privacy considerations and the notion that, you know, in order for, for that to work, you need family members to share genetic data with each other. And also, you start to play into the notion, and, and John, I've really enjoyed hearing you talk about, you know, the thoughts that you went through in, in getting your genome sequenced relative to this. You know, the notion that when you sequence your own genome, you are creating information content about, uh, probable, in a probabilistic sense, about your family members. And, 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 and you have to think about that and what the, what the implications of that are. So it's a very interesting area. And I think that, I think that this is an area where, you know, there, there actually is a lot of patient consent, uh, patient preference infrastructure that's needed. Because in order to really facilitate the, the kind of sharing that I'm talking about for family-based care, you really have to be able to accurately um, record and, and, and react to what, what patients want relative to that. And that's hard. All right, so I have one more question, which we're not going to be able to answer, so it's kind of our homework, I guess, for over coffee. And that's this one. It's kind of a big, big one. Is health information technology the missing link needed to make the healthcare system work better for providers and patients? What more needs to be done? We can't answer that here. Um, hopefully, the next day and a half, maybe as a group, we can in pieces and bits. So. Uh, let's take that with us down the hall to the coffee break. Let's first say thank you to our panelists and our speakers.